all uh, great teachers who have joined with us for this session today evening. Welcome to Hindi Vidya Prachas Committee's Ram Niranjan Junjunwala College. We look forward to listening to your talk, sir, and we welcome you for this session. Thank you very much, Rekha Madam. Yeah, thank you, madam. Uh, uh, now I invite uh, Dr. K. G. Bole, uh, the EC member of uh, IPT Mumbai Sub Regional Council, to uh, say a few words about IPT because this lecture series is being hosted jointly by IPT and Department of Physics R. J. College. So I invite uh, Dr. K. G. Bole. Bole, sir. Thank you, Rekha madam. Welcome you all. Indian Association of Physics Teacher is a nationwide body which was established in 1984 with the aim of upgrading the quality of teaching of physics as well as the physics teacher at all levels. It has more than 7,500 life members from all the members of our country. And conduct. We conduct every year national standard examination for which about two lakh students appear, and to these examinations, students are selected for international and national level Olympiad. It also conducts summer school competitions, workshops, and training programs, as well as the lecture series. The Ram Niranjan Dundurwala College is one of the renowned autonomous colleges in Mumbai. is always ready to help in many activities of iapt and uh, today's session is a uh, one of that thank you thank you bole sir for enlightening the participants about iapt and now i call my colleague from the department dr neeta srivastava to uh, introduce our today's uh, guest speaker नीता डॉक्टर नीता हेलो नीता हेलो डॉक्टर नीता प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल फ्रेंड प्लीज या 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 जस्ट नाउ अनम्यूटेड Thank you, Rekha. Good evening, one and all. On behalf of Hindi Vidya Prachar Samiti, Ram Niranjan Junjunwala College, Department of Physics, in association with IAPT Mumbai, I welcome you all for uh, Physics Lecture Series Four. I welcome our dear director, Dr. Usha Mukundan, our very active principal, Dr. Himan Shudabra, and all our participants, colleagues. and who has joined this session i feel honored to introduce today's speaker dr p s anil kumar who actually needs no introduction dr anil kumar obtained his phd degree from university of pune in 1998 he was a dutch technology foundation post doctoral fellow at university of twente in netherlands until 2000 then he joined max planck institute of microstructural physics germany he is also a humble research fellow he joined indian institute of science bangalore in 2004 where currently he is a professor of physics and dean of undergraduate program his research interest are in experimental condensed matter physics applied physics material science covering topics like spintronics magnetic nano structures magneto transport in metallic multilayers and oxides magnetic properties of ultra thin paramagnets spin polarized electron scattering topological matters and so on he has authored more than 200 research papers he has in his name many awards and accolades few of them are dae young scientist research award nasi scopus young scientist award 
Microsoft Research India Outstanding Young Faculty Award, DAE Raja Ramanna Lecture Award, Material Research Society Silver Jubilee Medal, etc. He is an associate editor of the journal Science and Technology of Advanced Material. So the list is too long and we are actually waiting eagerly to hear from you. So over to you, Dr. Kumar. Before uh, your talk starts, I would like to just request all our participants, colleagues, to if you have any query, please write in the chat box and uh, your queries will be answered after lecture is over. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Kumar. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nita, for this uh, introduction. Uh, let me first thank uh, Professor Kiran for inviting me uh, for this uh, lecture, and um, Dr. Rekha Gorpode and uh, others uh, from the college and uh, from IAPT for arranging uh, such uh, lectures for the students. So, Dr. Kiran told me that you know I should be uh, pitching at a very elementary level uh, for the entry-level undergraduate students. So then I'm going to speak uh, uh, very, very basics where uh, most of the work is done by others. I'm not showing my research work here. So this is the work done by the legends in this area, but I'm going to introduce this kind of work to the students uh, for their benefit. And they should take from, uh, from here on uh, to the next level. So before I um, start this uh, talk, I just wanted to show that, you know, this is a, the backdrop is the main building of the Indian Institute of Science, and we have celebrated, you know, 100 years uh, of existence in 2008. It's an age-old uh, institution, and uh, those who would like to come to IIC, please visit IIC. There are a lot many things to see at IIC campus. And uh, the talk on spintronics, let, uh, I generally start asking the questions to the students. How many of you are using a spintronic device? Probably in the chat box, some of the students can give an answer whether you are using spintronic device, yes or no. Because it becomes much more easy for me to know whether you know you, you have used spintronic devices in your life, yes or no. So probably if a couple of students can uh, type uh, their answer. So I got the first answer from Tushar Pandit saying no. And uh, is there further answers? Uh, Fine, I think uh, you know, it will take time. So let me just uh, rephrase my question. See, I think uh, generally when I give this lecture on spintronics, uh, many people tell me that you know, I have not used a spintronic device. So then I usually rephrase my question. The question I generally ask is that, are you using a computer? If so, are you using a computer that is made after 1998? If you're using a computer that is made after 1998, then the answer uh, to your, the, my first question that you are all using spintronic devices. So now the idea of this lecture to demonstrate to you how you are using and where you are using spintronic device and what is its advantage over conventional devices. So that is going to be my motivation of this talk. And at the end of this talk, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to convey to the students that, you know, the imagination is the limit as far as technological development is concerned. So in that respect, let me just start with a very basic introduction. So the first uh, thing which I wanted to start is about magnetism, you know? So you all know about uh, this cartoon of atom where you know, electrons are moving around the nucleus, but if you go a little bit more advanced with the quantum picture, then you see this orbital picture, et cetera. But the most important aspect which I want to draw your attention is on this, car this picture where you know, the electron is depicted having two different spin state. One is an up spin state, the other one is a down spin state. So these are the two distinct states of an electron as far as the spin is concerned. So you can consider this electron as a very tiny magnet, maybe with the North Pole pointing upwards or the other magnet with the North Pole pointing downwards, something like that. Now, if you talk, talk about the magnetism, the magnetism of a material is coming from the spin of this electron as well as this orbital angular momentum. So we, we don't want to do anything further from here. We just wanted to take this concept of the spin of an electron for our rest of the talk. Now, the question is that what is spintronics? 
Spintronics means it is spin-based electronics. Now, if you consider an electron, you all know that the electron has a charge, uh, also the electron has got a spin. Now, if you discuss about conventional electronics, which many, all of you are familiar with, we are going to manipulate uh, the electron charge uh, to uh, store information or process information, etc. You don't worry about the spin of the electron when you talk about a diode or when you talk about the transistor. You only worry about the charge of the electron and you are manipulating the charge of the electron. See, if it's a field effect transistor, you apply a gate voltage and you manipulate because the electron has got a charge, you manipulate its path. That's how the field effect transistors and this kind of devices work. So in conventional electronics, you don't worry about the spin of the electrons. You only worry about the charge of the electrons. Then comes the next generation, which is spintronics. That means you start manipulating the electrons by using their spin uh, along with its charge. So that means the, 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 the unused functionality of an electron, which is a spin, is being used in spintronics. So that is the advantage of, I mean, the spintronics. And soon you will see that where all people will be using spintronics. Now, if you look at this, uh, this cartoon, uh, let me just, yeah. My chat box is on my way. Let me just clear my chat box. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So if you look at this uh, particular cartoon, you see that this is the spintronic material technology we are talking about. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are contributing this uh, technology. So you need a physicist, you need material scientists, you need electrical engineers, you need, you know, different kinds of people uh, should come and contribute to the spintronic material technology. And what is coming out of the spintronic material technology is amazing. So let us take one by one. So I'll be talking about, see, for example, speed, location, angle sensing. When you talk about spintronics, uh, that is something which I'm going to explain a little bit later, that you can make high quality magnetic field sensors. So one of the advantages of spintronics is that you can get good quality magnetic field sensor. What do you mean by a good quality magnetic field sensor? Imagine that I have a magnet in my hand, and if I have a magnetic field sensor, the quality of a sensor is decided by the fact that how small I can make the magnet and at what distance I can sense this magnetic field of this magnet. So if I have a sensor in my hand, the first question is that how small I can make this magnet, still the sensor can sense, and how far I can take it, still the sensor can sense. So the spintronics technology will allow you to make a very highly sensitive magnetic field sensors. Now you may ask the question, if I have a very good quality magnetic field sensor, where can I use it? Imagine that you are bicycling and imagine that you are keeping a ma tiny magnetic field sensor on the fork of your bicycle and a small magnet on the rim of your bicycle. And when you are bicycling, this, 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 this tire rotates and then this magnet comes in front of this uh, fork and then this magnetic field sensor gets a signal. Now, if you make the next ro rotation, again, uh, this gives a signal when it comes in front of that. So the total distance traveled is 2 pi r and the time between two signals is delta t. So then 2 pi r by delta t gives you the speed of your bicycle, right? So it can be a speed sensor. Now imagine that you are opening a door and you, you, you connect a motor to open this door and you switch on the motor and the motor rotates and the door opens. And when the door opens and unless you stop it in time, it will go and come and bang onto the wall. So now imagine that I kept a small magnet, a magnetic field sensor onto the wall and a tiny magnet on this door and when this magnet comes close to the magnetic field sensor, the sensor gives a signal and that signal is given back to a feedback loop saying, stop the motor. So now the door opens and it just stops. You don't have to switch off the motor. So that means now it has become a position sensor. Now, if you imagine that I'm keeping an array of sensors on the way and maybe 10 sensors, when I rotate 90 degree, for each 10 degree rotation, I get a signal. So I get an angle. And modern sensors can even, without an array of sensors, with a single sensor itself, it can measure the angle. So a magnetic field sensor can be a position sensor, a location sensor, or an angle sensor, 
and your imagination is the only limit where you can think about using a sensor. If you take a modern car, there are several sensors, magnetic field sensors for different purposes. Now the modern cars for the fuel injection, the, the, the acceleration, the pedal acceleration, maybe the steering, everything can be kind of, you know, optimized or improved by using magnetic field sensors. So the magnetic field sensor is an area where enormous applications are there. And Spintronics technology allows you to make good quality magnetic field sensors. So that's why uh, the magnetic field sensors are very important and Spintronics is contributing to that. So soon you will realize where this exactly is coming in. So the next one is about the data storage in our computer hard disks. So in the computer hard disk, uh, we are using tiny magnets to store the information, right? So I'll come back to that. And if time permits, I will discuss about one more small aspect, uh, which is magnetic random access memory. So these are the topics that I will cover in this lecture. And there are next generation applications and the field is just growing like anything. And those things are at a much higher level, which we will not discuss at this point of time. So, now consider a ferromagnetic material, right? So you are all dealt with a magnet. And if you look at the ferromagnetic hysteresis loop of a material, you will get a kind of a continuous curve like that, that is there in the 12th standard textbook. Now I'm going to refine that magnet to a one level up saying that this is a single crystal magnet, right? So imagine that I have a magnet, this is a single crystalline magnet, and in, a, in such a magnet, I can define something called as an easy axis of magnetization and a hard axis of magnetization. The name itself is suggesting that if I have a magnet like this, it is easy to magnetize along certain direction, and it is difficult or hard to magnetize in the opposite, in, in a perpendicular direction, that's why I call it as a, a easy axis magnet and a hard axis thing. Now, if I consider this magnet, and if I start applying a magnetic field along the easy axis direction, and you see that at a sufficiently high magnetic field, the magnetization is saturated. Now, even if I remove this magnetic field, I bring the magnetic field back to zero. In this graph, your X axis is the magnetic field. Y axis is the magnetization of the material. Even after you bring this uh, applied magnetic field back to zero, the magnetization remains as 100%. This is called 100% remanence. Now, if you increase this magnetic field in the negative direction and above a critical field, the magnetization switches to the opposite direction. Now, this is magnetized in the opposite direction. Now, the south and north pole is like this. In the previous case, the south and north poles were opposite to each other. So, this is called the magnetic hysteresis. And this hysteresis can be used for memory application. Now, if you consider that the applied field is in this direction and the easy axis of magnetization is in this direction. Now, in such a situation, if you start applying a magnetic field, as you increase the magnetic field, more and more magnetic moments will get aligned in the direction of the applied field and up to a critical field. At that field, all the magnetic moments get aligned in the direction of the applied field. Now, no matter how uh, you increase, how much you increase this magnetic field, the magnetization remains constant because all the magnetic moments have aligned in the direction of the magnetic field. Now, if I start reducing this magnetic field, now you see here, and as I reduce the magnetic field, the magnetic moments will start going to its original direction. Finally, at zero applied magnetic field, all the magnetic moment is going in its own direction. So there's no component of magnetization in that direction. You get zero magnetic moment. And if you increase the magnetic field in the opposite direction, again, it gets saturated. So this linear response regime is used for the sensor application. And this hysteresis loop is used for the memory application. Now think about how you store information in your computer hard disk. Imagine that I have a tiny magnet like this in my hand. And this is the, the sharp edge, I mean the, the sharp edge of this. And I say that this sharp edge, uh, in the tapered edge is the north pole of this magnet. And this edge is the south pole of this magnet. Now I say that, look, I'm going to keep this magnet on my palm with this north pole pointing towards you. 
when i say that when the north pole is pointing towards you i define this is the zero state of this magnet let us just give some name zero state of this magnet now i take this magnet put it in the opposite direction that means the sharp edge is towards me then i call this as a one state so now this is a zero state and this is a one state with this magnet i have now created a memory so you know the binary like zero and one so this is a zero state and this is a one state now if i have two such magnets so if i keep two such magnets on my palm now both the sharp edges is towards you if i say this is zero and zero state and if i put it like this it is zero and one state if i put this also like this it's one and one state now with the two magnets i have created two bits of information now similarly i can keep on doing this exercise you know if i have four magnets like this if i keep all the four pointed edges towards you if i keep all the pointed edges towards you it's a 0 0 state and if i bring one like this it is 1 0 0 0 state if i bring like this it is becoming 1 1 0 0 state now if i bring like this i have brought 1 1 1 0 state if i bring all the magnets towards me it's all one state so with the four magnets i have created four bits of information right so this is precisely how you keep information store information in your computer hard disk now let us see uh, let let me ch uh, check on you you are all hearing me right there's no connection lost in between right uh, professor kiran can you just uh, Go ahead. update me you are yes, you are still hearing me right yes okay great okay fine so now with the four four such magnet uh, magnets you have four bits of information now if you if you look at this this is how the information is stored in your computer depending upon the north and south pole direction you can define 1 1 0 0 kind of thing now you have eight such bits then it is one byte so you have eight such magnets i'm not going to do this exercise now the different combinations of this zeros and ones can define characters like you know capital a b c d small a b c d alpha beta gamma so different things can be represented by this one byte like eight bits together so this is how you store information in your computer hard disk now comes uh, the interesting question that i have is that now what happens if i bring two magnets close to each other if i bring two magnets close to each other see if i bring two magnets like this all of you know that it will start repelling because i'm bringing two north poles close to each other if i bring two magnets like this it starts attracting because it is north and south pole now if i bring two magnets like this what happens if i bring them close enough all of you might have experienced that you know if you take two magnets in your hand it just goes like that so that means if i write information like uh, like a zero here and if i put another magnet with a zero information there if this magnets are close to each other if they start interacting then this becomes 1 0 1 0 1 0 kind of a situation so that means you need to make this magnet at far away distance so that the presence of one magnet is not influencing the second magnet so that means you are independently able to store this information in this different magnets here so this is how you store the information here now the question is that you know if i take uh, such kind of uh, eight uh, pencils and then put it in, uh, at far away distance in order to write eight bits now maybe in this room which is 500 square feet room i may be able to put 100 such magnets and maybe uh, you know in our computer hard disk nowadays 1 terabyte means 1 into 10 to the power 12 into 9 such magnets so uh, approximately 10 power 13 magnets of this kind is sitting in your computer hard disk you may wonder how 10 power 13 such magnets you know you need the entire maharashtra state to spread this information so whereas you know that is all happening in a small uh, hard drive where this information is stored so now let us see how this information is stored so what happens the trick here is that make this magnet smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller so i'm just giving you an image don't worry about this image just look at this image 
you see the size of the bit, the, the magnet in, in, your, in your computer hard disk is approximately, this is a two, hard disk of 2000. It is uh, 35 gigabit per square inch. The width of this magnet is approximately 45 nanometer. And the length of this is 380 nanometer. So now you imagine, you know, how small is 45 nanometer? Take your hair. The diameter of your hair is typically between 50 and 100 micrometer. So you take your hair, imagine that my hair has 90 micron in diameter, take my hair and vertically split 2000 times. So then you have this uh, 45 nanometer. So 90 micrometer hair, if I take my hair and vertically split, not along the length, that is easy. Uh, vertically you split 2000 times, take one piece out of it, that is 45 nanometer. That was the size of the bit in our computer hard disk way back in 2000, right? Now, if you look at this, this figure, this is an interesting figure, only worry about this particular thing. You see, this is the minimum size of the magnets that you have in your computer hard disk. And as time progressed, what happened? The size of the bit became smaller and smaller. That's why we started getting computers with the larger and larger you know, hard disk space. And suddenly you see that it, it would have continued like this, like a straight line and you know somewhere today you may have something like you know maybe a one gigabyte computer hard disk or something like that but you see here somewhere in 1995 1998 time scale you see that the slope started changing the size of the bit became suddenly much smaller so the bit, bit became smaller and smaller and smaller so the reason is uh, we'll have to come back to the next picture so when I ask this question, what is the state of the magnet? This is a zero state because you know that this pointed edge is towards you. And this is a one state because the pointed edge towards me. How do I know in a computer hard disk when uh, millions of such magnets are there, which one is the zero state or which one is a one state? So if I have a magnet, if, without labeling this, if I give you this space, again, to find a north and south pole, you will you will wonder how to do it. You know, some people will, uh, you know, hang it so it will get aligned in the north-south direction or somebody will bring a compass. The compass will tell me which one is the north pole, which one is the south pole. Now, if I bring a compass on this 10 power 13 magnets, the compass won't know what to do because, you know, they are randomly arranged zeros and ones. So the trick is to make a compass which is smaller than the size of the bit. So if you make a compass or a sensor, a magnetic sensor, which is smaller than the size of this magnet, then what you can do is that you can bring this, that sensor on top of this magnet. And this, this magnet, when it is like this, there are magnetic lines of force outside. If this sensor can sense the direction of this magnetic lines of force, then it can tell you whether it's a zero state or a one state. So this is precisely hap happening in your computer hard disk. You look at here, this is a north-south, north-south kind of arrangement here and there is something called a read head in your computer hard disk. So this read head, prior to 1998, it was something called a magnetoresistive read head. So magnetoresistance means the resistance of a material changes when you apply a magnetic field. So if I have magnetic lines of force outside, if I bring that material on top of this, the material changes its resistance and you measure the resistance change, from there you will come to know whether it is magnetized, I mean, when the lines of force are like this or the lines of force are in the opposite. This is how you read this information. This is what was happening uh, up to uh, this point. Then suddenly from this point of view, a new concept that got introduced called giant magnetoresistive read heads. So the name itself suggests earlier it was magnetoresistive. Now it is giant magnetoresistance. The name itself suggests that the change in resistance is very high. As you make this bit smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens is the magnetic field strength also goes smaller and smaller and smaller. The old magnetoresistive head, where the resistance change was so low that you cannot make it too small. So you need to have a sufficient size of the bit to pick up this information. That's why it was going at a very slow rate. Then suddenly after the introduction of giant magnetoresistance, which we will discuss in detail, that suddenly the bit size started becoming much smaller because you are able to read this information back from the disk 
at a much, much efficient way, even from a smaller bit. So that is why we are able to make the bit size much, much smaller and the hard disk capacity much larger. So now the second aspect that you need to worry about is that let us look at uh, today's hard disk where the magnetic moments are not like this lying or like this. It is perpendicularly magnetized. You know that, you know, as you go to Bombay city, you see multi-story buildings where, you know, the palatial houses in the village is, you know, was spreading horizontally. Now you're uh, going upward. Similarly, the real estate in the hard disk is also very expensive. So people started making perpendicularly magnetized bits uh, up magnetized or down magnetized. Now the question is that if I, if I say up magnetized is a zero state and down magnetized is a one state, how do you know? Because there's a sharp edge here. Now in a computer disk, what happens? You bring your read head, the read head will see whether it is magnetized upward or downward. So this is how you read this information. Now, how do you write the information? See here, it was very easy for me to change from here to here. But in a computer hard disk, what happens is very interesting. You have something called a right head. So right head is a yolk in which a coil is wind, wound around that. Now, if I pass plus current to this, then it creates a magnetic field here. And here you look at this pole piece, it's very, very narrow. So the field is concentrated here. And here it is very wide, so less magnetic field. Now, if you start increasing the current at a particular current, you know that when the coercivity of this material, uh, when, the, when the magnetic field generated is less, more than the coercivity of this material, this magnetization switches. Now it is switched uh, so that the, uh, the, it's a uh, pointed edge is upward. Now, if I reverse the current in this coil, then what happens? The, 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 the current will give you a magnetic field in that uh, open area. And that, that magnetic field, if it is more than the coercivity of this material, it switches its magnetization. So I can switch from zero state to one state at my will by bringing this read edge. So in a computer hard disk, when you start writing this information, you hear a sound. So what happens? There is a disk that is rotating at 7,000 to 10,000 RPM speed. And there is a, a read head that is sitting on top of that. And there are tracks today, the track with this 90 nanometer, that means uh, I will have in my hair 1,000 such tracks. And for each track, you bring this uh, right head and then you rotate this disc. So you bring each bit below this disc, right zero or one, whatever you want, then bring the next bit, next bit, next bit, next bit like that. When it takes a complete rotation, one track is completed. Then if I retract this back, I can track the next one, next track, next track like that. So this is how you read, write the information in your hard disk. Similarly, when you try to read this information, this read head, which is sitting here, is also sensing the direction of magnetic field of the bit below that. And then, so each bit is brought below this read head and the information is read as zeros and ones back. So this is precisely how you write and read information in your computer hard disk. And very interestingly, this uh, read head and the right head thing is flying at a distance of almost a nanometer or a couple of nanometers just above the disk and rotating at 7,000 RPM or 10,000 RPM speed you see the precision that is going in there. You know, one nanometer separation, rotating at 7,000 RPM, 10,000 RPM, and each bit is brought below the read head to read this information. This is what is happening when you try to read something in your computer. Similarly, when you write a file, same thing is happening. You hear a sound, this is rotating, and each bit is brought below your, your right head, and that's how you write this information. This is precisely how you re read and write information in your computer hard disk. So that brings me to this slide. Uh, this also tells you that, you know, as time progresses, the aerial density, which is gigabyte per square inch, was getting improved. This is the introduction of the first magnetoresistive read head. And I asked you the question, who all are using a computer which is made after 1998? Because that was the introduction of the first GMR head. Then you saw that it started increasing much faster. So, and it is keep on increasing even today. But if you just compare a computer of 1960s, uh, the old computer and the state of art hard disk, you see that the information stored on 24 inch, 50 such disks to just keep an information of five MB. Whereas today the density has gone about, you know, one terabit per square inch. So that is giving me 
just on a 2.5 inch disk, several terabytes of information. So the hard disk has moved from this side to that side with all this advance. And what was the key player is the giant magneto resistance, which I'm going to discuss next. At the same time, I also just want to tell you that, so we are also reaching something called the super paramagnetic limit. So if I consider this is a ferromagnet, if I start reducing the size of this ferromagnet below a certain size of this ferromagnet, the ferromagnet loses its ferromagnetism and it becomes a super paramagnet. That means uh, the, the thermal energy, usually if it is a magnetized like this, and if I want to magnetize in the opposite direction, I apply a magnetic field, it has to go through a barrier. So when the, when the energy is sufficient to go through this barrier, it goes to the other side. So this barrier height is proportional to the volume of the particle and the anisotropic constant of this particle. As the volume becomes smaller and smaller, this energy barrier becomes smaller. And because this energy barrier is small, the thermal energy is sufficient to switch the magnetization. That means in the super paramagnetic limit, this magnet can keep fluctuating from one direction to the other direction. So there won't be any fixed zero state or one state. So one way to improve this is to increase the anisotropic constant, etc. There's a lot of research that is going on in that direction now. So let us don't worry about the super paramagnetic limit at this point of time. Now we understood how the information is stored in our computer. And now let me, I also told you that how the information is read back by a read head. Now, what is this read head made of that I told you this is called a uh, giant magneto resistance. So the giant magneto resistance was discovered in 1980s, 86, 87 timescale by two independent researchers, Professor Albert Furt and Peter Grunberg. One is from France and the other person is from Germany. So they were working on this area for quite a long time. And what they did finally, I mean, I will tell you the end results. There are a lot of other results also there, but I'll tell you the end result that's happening is here. Uh, there is a comment that's coming in. Let me see what is the comment. Okay, I think it's about the PPT. Okay, fine. Uh, look at here. Here, what's happening is that this is, uh, look at this graph. Here, there is a magnetic field which is changing and this is the resistance. Here, look at the, look at the numbers here. 30 angstroms of iron and 18 angstroms of chromium and 30 times of that. Look at this, 30 angstroms of iron and nine angstroms of chromium and 50, 60 times. So that means you take a very thin layer of iron, 30 angstroms, right? Very, very, very thin. And you take nine angstroms of chromium. And when you make a multi-layer stack of this, this was the real challenge because you, know, you need to have very, very flat, smooth interfaces. And what they found is that the resistance changes from by a factor of two. That means the resistance, if it was one ohm earlier, it has gone to uh, 0.5 ohm. That means there is a 50% change in its resistance with an application of, of course, high magnetic field, which is 20 kilogauss. Now you, you see this earlier, the magneto resistance was a couple of percentage, like, you know, two, three, four percentage in like an isotropic magneto resistance. Now it has gone to 50%. So that's why it is called as giant magneto resistance. So these are the pioneers, Albert Ford and Peter Grunberg, who got this. Now imagine iron. If I take iron and look at the magneto resistance, it's feeble. You take chromium and look at the magneto resistance, it is feeble. So most of us will discard that at that point of time. But these people, that's the genius, they did not discard. They had an idea that, look, if I make this into this particular structure, it must give you giant magneto resistance. And they worked on it. And in 1980s, they became successful. Now, uh, another giant figure in this area is uh, Professor Stuart Parkin. Uh, he was at IBM at that time. Now he's a director of Max Planck Institute in Germany. So he also studied these systems very extensively. And he was responsible mainly to get them into the technology now. So now what he studied was he varied the thickness of this chromium and he found that there is an oscillation in the percentage of magneto resistance. Only for certain thickness of chromium, this gives large magneto resistance. For certain other thickness, there's no magneto resistance. So there's a lot of advancement that has happened due to the work carried out by IBM people. 
So now what is the end goal? So 1988, they first published saying that, look, we have observed giant magneto resistance. In 1998, it came to our computer hard disk. That's why we have high density hard disk today. And in 2007, they got the Nobel Prize in physics. So they shared the Nobel Prize for the discovery of giant magneto resistance. Now let us understand in the remaining time, what is this giant magneto resistance? In order to understand the giant magneto resistance, the students at the first year BSc may not be familiar with the band structure, but still let me just tell you that every material has got a band structure, which will tell you in, at what energy, with what momentum the electrons are existing, etc. So let us don't worry about it. If you consider a paramagnet, I can talk something called spin dependent band structure. That means you can have electrons with up spin and electrons with the down spin equal in numbers at the Fermi level, right? So everything is equal. Or other extreme, I can have something called a half metallic ferromagnet, where for a particular spin, there is finite density of states at the Fermi level. For the other spin, it's almost like an insulator. So for one type of spin, it's a conductor, it's a metal. For the other kind of spins, it's an insulator. And the conventional ferromagnets, this is called 100% spin polarization, P equal to one. And this is polarization zero, P equal to zero. And the conventional ferromagnets, which we are dealing with iron, cobalt, nickel, and its alloys is around 30 to 40% of spin polarization. That means there is majority electrons are of one type and the minority electrons of the other type. So that gives rise to the spin polarization. Now, because of this, what happens? You can think about spin polarized electron transport. You take a copper wire, like a normal metal. You pass electrons through it. So you connect an electrical connection. So the electrical connection will pump both up and down spin electrons in equal in number. So at the end of this day, when you look at that, here also the number of electrons, the up electrons are same as the number of down spin electrons. Whereas in a ferromagnetic metal, if you put 50% up electrons and 50% down electrons, what happens? One kind of electron will undergo more scattering compared to the other electron. And more scattering means more resistance. And finally, you will see that only one type of electrons, predominantly one type of electrons come out and you have, you know, uh, other, see when 75% of electrons come with up spin, 25% uh, comes with the down spin. Whereas in this particular case, you see 50% coming with up spin and 50% coming with down spin. So there is something called spin polarized electron transport. Hello, Anidu. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, in between, yeah, I yeah. lost the connection. Okay. Okay. So Go ahead. Now, Go ahead. Yeah, now look at here the thickness of these layers. Uh, okay. Now I'm making a tri-layer structure. Uh, let me just repeat in case if I missed that point here. So this is ferromagnet one, and this is ferromagnet two, separated by a non-ferromagnetic metallic layer. And the thickness of these layers are much smaller than the mean free path of uh, the electrons in these layers. So that means a, a majority uh, and uh, a downspin electron from here can even come here. An upspin electron can come here. A downspin electron can go from here to there. An upspin can go from to there to there. So in this channel, when they travel, what happens? When the magnetization of these two ferromagnetic layers are parallel to each other, the same phenomena as I discussed earlier will come into picture here. So what happens? The majority electrons will be coming here. So the minority electrons, so say the downspin electron for the time being, I call it as a minority electron, are scattered within the structure and then you are losing them, whereas the other type of electrons come here, right? So now when this material is parallelly magnetized, now what I do, I make them anti-parallelly magnetized. So that means 
uh, an upspin scattering here is equivalent to a downspin scattering here. So that means the ma material is magnetized in the opposite direction. The, the majority electrons for this channel is the minority electrons here and vice versa. Because of that scattering, you know, uh, since an electron from here, uh, from here goes to there and that electron comes to here, what happens? These electrons, the many of these upspin electrons get uh, removed from the system and only a small number of electrons come to the other side. So then what happens here? You look at here. In this case, when the magnetizations are anti-parallel, more scattering. That's why less electrons come out here. More scattering means high resistance. So if you look at this Jan magneto resistance here, this is the state at zero magnetic field. These two magnetic layers are anti-ferromagnetically coupled or anti-parallelly coupled due to you know variety of physics which we will not discuss now. Now when you apply a sufficiently large magnetic field, so I start increasing the magnetic field here. In this particular case when I apply 20 kilo instead of magnetic field, this anti-parallel coupling is broken and they are brought parallel to each other. When they are forcefully brought parallel to each other, now more electrons come out because less scattering. Only one type of spins are scattered here. So now this is a low resistance state and this is a high resistance state. This is how you get a high resistance state to a low resistance state transition in the GMR structures, right? So this is the, this is the concept which they were trying to make it, but the challenge was to make extremely clean interfaces. This, uh, this ferromagnetic atoms should not come to this non-magnetic layer. And this non-ferromagnetic layer atom should not come to the ferromagnetic layer because if there is an atom from this ferromagnetic layer comes to this layer, then that can act as a scattering sender. A lot of things can happen. So that is why they tried several years to get extremely clean interfaces with MBE techniques. That's how made it. they made it. Then parallelly, uh, Professor Stuart Parkin, he said that, look, here you need 20 kilo instead of magnetic field to switch the magnetizations. So let us think about something else. So he devised something called a spin valve layer. That means he took one hard magnetic layer and a soft magnetic layer separated by a non ferromagnetic metallic layer. Here, what happens, this is the only graph which I'm showing from my own research, which is done somewhere in 1998, 99 time scale. When you apply a large magnetic field, both cobalt and permalloy is magnetized here in the same direction. As I decrease the magnetic field, cross the magnetic field, go to a negative magnetic field, the permaloy has an extremely low coercivity. The permaloy layer magnetized in the opposite direction. Now, permaloy is in this direction, uh, permaloy is in this direction, and cobalt is in this direction. Now, if I increase the magnetic field further, and if I reach the coercivity of the cobalt, even the cobalt layer switches, now both the layers are parallel here. So there is a state, and there is an anti parallel state. There is a parallel state. Now this can be done with an extremely low magnetic field, one or two oyster, even smaller than that. So that is how this kind of structure, again, same physics as I discussed earlier, uh, when the layers are parallel to each other, one kind of spin passes through and the other kind of spin undergoes a lot of scattering. Whereas when the two magnetic layers are anti-parallel to each other, both the spin get scattered, that is leading to a high resistance state. So this is a low resistance state and this is a high resistance state. So now how this is happening, just imagine an experiment you are doing with optics, optics experiment with a polarizer. You have a polarizer and you pass an unpolarized beam of uh, light. And after passing this polarizer, the beam gets polarized. Now if I kept another polarizer here and if the polarizing angles are same, then the light will be passing through. If I make this a polarizer 90 degree, that means cross polarized, the light will not pass through. So, here by rotating the polarization uh, axis by 90 degree, you either pass light or you block the light. Here, it's a valve for spins. The two layers, when they are made parallel, you pass electrons through. When you make the two layers anti parallel, you block the electrons. So, this is like a spin valve. So, this is named as a spin valve. And how you make it? by applying a small magnetic field and switching the direction of the magnetizer. Now imagine that uh, on top of your bit, there is magnetic lines of force. If that field is sufficient to switch the magnetization, it will switch the magnetization. 
So when you bring your reed head onto your bit, and when the resistance is, uh, when the bit is direct opposite in this direction, then this uh, bottom layer will al get aligned in like that, and you will get a low resistance state. When it's a low resistance state, you say it's a one state. When you are, uh, when you go to the next bit and it switches the magnetization because the next bit is aligned in the opposite direction, for example, then you'll get a high resistance state. Just by looking at the low resistance, high resistance state, you'll be able to tell this. Thing. See, this is how you uh, get this information. So the challenge here in the next five minutes, let me just um, tell you, uh, the spin valve is something like this, like a burger bun. So you have a, a top bun, ferromagnet one, bottom bun, ferromagnet two, and there is a sandwich in between. I mean, uh, it's a burger in between. This is a non-ferromagnetic metal. So you, if you take this bun out, you will see that a lot of sauce into that, right? So this is the challenge what experimentalists are also facing. The, the in-between layer get diffused into the top layer and the top layer getting diffused into the bottom layer. So finally, the idea is to make extremely flat interfaces, uh, very clean interfaces, no interdiffusion, et cetera. With this, let me just uh, uh, ask uh, 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 one more thing, which is called tunnel magnetoresistance. Here, everything same as the previous one. Look at here, two ferromagnetic layers. In previously, there was a metallic layer in between. Now I replace this metallic layer with a thin insulating layer. So there's a thin insulating layer. So this was proposed way back in 1975. Now, what happens? When the two ferromagnets are parallel to each other, the electrons, now if I apply a potential difference between these two layers, the electron can tunnel from one ferromagnet to the other ferromagnet. This is exactly the same as the one dimensional potential barrier problem, which you will be studying a little later. So electrons, see, you must have seen this movie when a man is running towards a wall and he's, uh, you know, if I go towards this wall, I'll be blocked. But in that movie, you see that the man running towards the wall, diffusing through the wall and going to the other side. So he's tunneling through the wall. Similarly, the electrons can tunnel across this potential barrier to the other side. So this tunneling is not an ordinary tunneling. The electron can also sense whether the second ferromagnet is aligned parallel or anti-parallel. If the second ferromagnet is aligned parallel, more electrons can tunnel. You give a given potential difference, more electrons tunnel means more current. For a given resistance, more current means less resistance. Now, when I make this magnetizations anti-parallel to each other, then this electron will not tunnel. When the electron is not tunneling, less current, or low tunneling, less current. For same potential difference, if there is less current, it's a high resistance state. Here also, you can get a high resistance state or a low resistance state, depending upon whether the second ferromagnetic layer is aligned parallel to the first layer or opposite, to, I mean, anti-parallel to the first layer. And this is another technique that is, uh, you know, in 1995, this was experimentally demonstrated with the cobalt iron alumina, which is a tunnel barrier. And with the cobalt second ferromagnetic layer, they found 10% magnetoresistance or it's called tunnel magnetoresistance. Magnetoresistance because you have a, a change in magnetization and you change the resistance and it is assisted through a tunneling process. That's why it's a tunnel magnetoresistance. Presently, we are getting more than 500%. So this was demonstrated with the 10%, now it's 500%. And this alumina, which is now uh, replaced by single crystalline uh, insulating layer like MGO. And very critical here, as the width of the tunnel barrier increases, the tunnel current falls off you know, much. This is what we teach the students also in the one dimensional potential barrier problem. As the width of the tunnel barrier goes, the current drops uh, you know, much drastically down. So tunnel magnetoresistance, I may ask the question, if anybody is using a tunnel magnetoresistance, mostly the answer will be no, but still I'll rephrase the question, is anybody using a computer that is made after 2005? So if you look at this, uh, this is the physics, you, you look at here, so the introduction of giant magnetoresistance was in uh, 1998, and in 2005 time scale, the TMR read head. So today the modern computers which we have using the tunnel magnetoresistive read heads. So that's why we get much larger capacity. Now, uh, so this is the physics behind it. Now, this tunnel magnetoresistance also can be used for memory application. So imagine that one trilayer structure, when the magnetization is parallel, then it has got a 
a low resistance state, then I will call this as a zero state. When the magnetizations are anti-parallel, the resistance is high and I call it as a one state. Now, just by looking at whether the resistance is low or high, you can decide whether this is a zero state or one state. And this is the architecture that is put forward by IBM. And now there is a lot of changes. It's not this way people are doing it. People are doing it in a different way. But still, I can just tell you that how this works. What happens? You pass current through this line. So that creates a magnetic field around it. And this magnetic field will switch all the magnetization of these layers, which you don't want because you don't want to change the memory everywhere. And you pass some current through this. And there is a top line and pass some current through that line. So you, it creates magnetic field by both the lines. At the junction point, both the magnetic fields will superimpose and you can switch the magnetization. That means by passing current through these lines, you can make it parallel or you can make it anti-parallel. So that means now if I want to change the ith row, jth column element, you pass current through the ith row and the jth column, bit line and the word line, you switch the magnetization, you go from zero state to one state. Now, if you want to go from one state to zero state, you just reverse the current. Magnetic field is opposite, and field is sufficient to switch the course. I mean, it's more than the coercivity of the material. It switches back. Now, without a read head going to a place and reading this information remotely, you can just look at the resistance of the ith row jth column, and you can find out this information. So this is why this, this is perceived as a random access memory. So this uh, uh, magnetic random access memory uh, right now, it is not there in the consumer market, but where are, whereas for very high-end applications and strategic applications, the, the magnetoresistive random access memory is used. Why it is used? It has got a lot of disadvantage. For example, the DRAM, which you have in your computer hard disk, needs a battery backup. Whereas MRAM, once you write the information, it is staying forever, right? So it is a non-volatile memory. So you don't need a battery backup to keep the information in your RAM. So it's a non-volatile memory. And the write time is comparable to your DRAM. And the read time is also comparable. The read method, it is destructive. See, the DRAM is destructive, whereas MRAM is non-destructive. You're only measuring the resistance. The resistance measurement will not change the state. Whereas for a DRAM, see, for example, you know, I have just brought to this, you know, this is a bottle of water, right? I can also define a memory with this water bottle. When the water is full, I call it as a one state. And when there is no water, I call it as a zero state. So now I'm creating a two bit memory with a water bottle. This is one, this is zero. If I bring the third water bottle, this is a one state. So it's a one zero one state. Now the question is that, how do we know that this is a one state? Because you saw water here, right? If you want to, if you see that if this is an opaque bottle, what you will do? You will open this bottle, throw water out, and if water is coming out, you know it was a one state. Now what you will do, you have to throw away this water and fill it back, otherwise you are losing the memory. So I will throw out water and I find that water is coming out, it's a one state, I fill the water back and keep it back. So it's a, a one state again. So this is a destructive way of looking at it. But in, in your DRAM also, it's something like this, you're storing charges. And looking at the charges, whether the charge is there or not, you decide whether it's a one state or a zero state. So in a DRAM, you completely, you know, you have to discharge to see whether it was charged. So after this discharging, you have to charge back, right? That's why it is called a destructive method. And the rewrite cycle is comparable. The operating current is much smaller for MRAM and it is going even, even much lower because Right now, I'm talking about applying a magnetic field, passing a current through a line, creating a magnetic field, using that magnetic field to switch the magnetization. But nowadays, no, you don't need that. You can just pass pin polarized current through a ferromagnet and switch the magnetization at a very, very small current limits. So this number is much lower. Similarly, the standby current for a DRAM is much high and for MRAM is zero because the DRAM has a hole in this bottle. So the charge is getting, you know, going out from here. So you, whatever the rate at which the charge is going out, you have to fill it up. So that is for which you need a standby current. So the, 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 DRAM, the MRAM has got much more advantages than a DRAM. So I think with this, I will just stop and take some questions. So we, to summarize, I just told you what is spintronics, which is spin-based electronics. And I explained to you how the read, uh, computer hard disk uh, stores information and retrieves the information. For reading the information, you are using something called 
giant magneto resistance from 1998 to certain time and then as time progressed uh, we started using uh, magnetic tunnel junctions for this purpose and the next generation device that comes out of this is going to be magnetic random access memory with this let me just stop my presentation here thank you for your attention Uh, can I request Nita Madam to please take up the questions from chat box? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a second. A yeah, yeah, just open the chat box. There are two three yeah. questions right now. Yes, yes. So thank you very much, sir. For a very interesting talk, sir. And um, I would like to put some questions from here. Uh, this is uh, from Ketan Kumar. Uh, I think I am heard. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is from Ketan Kumar. Uh, what is future scope of magnetic RAM? See, uh, enormous scope. I mean, it's only the price that is prohibiting you from putting this magnetic RAM in your computer hard disk now. See the advantage is that if you if you if you don't have, if it's a non-volatile memory you have instant on computers right so you don't need time to you know boot up your computer etc so you'll have instant on computers and also right now the cost the cost is enormous at this point of time but there are industries who are working towards uh, uh, M RAMs and there are high end sectors which are using M RAM as on today uh, for strategic applications and other things you know. You don't want volatile memory for strategic thing. Every day, nobody cannot go and check whether the battery is working or not. So you need to get this done when you need it. So nobody can check the battery every day. So you need non-volatile memory. And there are uh, industries now uh, demonstrated, uh, you know, MRAMs, and it has not come to the consumer uh, market because it is too expensive. But it comes to our computer. You know, you may imagine your mobile phone. You know. The speed at which, imagine your entire hard disk, if it can be uh, used with MRAM, how fast you can write and how fast you can read. Now the data reading speed is around milliseconds for uh, your computer hard disk, right? Hard disk. Imagine that your entire hard disk, if it can be a RAM, then, you know, the speed at which you can write and read information, you know. Now suppose if you want to buy a, uh, write, uh, you know, 50 MB file, it takes some time, right? Whereas those kind of things will be much, much faster in future. So next question is from uh, Madhavi uh, Thakur Desai, and her question is, uh, what is the probability that the spintronics replace electronics? Yeah, it's, it's not a question of replacing electronics. So you have to find out the area at which, uh, at which this material will have superior functionality. It cannot replace anything. See, for example, there was a proposal for something called spin field effect transistor. Still, it is in its infancy and people are still working on it. It is not a question of replacing. It's a question of adding functionality to the existing thing and then taking it forward. So spintronics still, I would say it is in its, you know, it's only 20, 30 year old area. And uh, what electronics has enjoyed in 1970s is what spintronics is enjoying today. And a lot more developments needs to be done. So it's not that so even today, you know, I have not spoken about, you know, this is about, you know, two-dimensional uh, way of uh, storing the information. Now, people are thinking about three-dimension, you know. So, imagine, you know, 1,000 terabits is going to be your limit to, you know, store information. You know, think in that direction. So, it's enormous scope. This is only a beginning. A lot more things can be done. It will not replace electronics per se, but it will add a lot of functionality, new functions to our, you know, technology. So, uh, Mr. Satyanarayan Reddy is uh, asking whether uh, can uh, whether you can uh, uh, give your PPT. You can send your PPT for this presentation. I will send it to Professor Kiran so he can share this. Right? I'll convert it into. But please don't share it in a public domain because you know I, I'm using data from different places. I try to you know reference it everywhere. But you know it's better that uh, you keep it with you only. Huh? Uh, so, one question from my side, uh, and uh, I just uh, want to know that uh, while making uh, GMR materials or uh, CMR materials, uh, how do we actually uh, find that um, 
what should be the stoichiometry first of all and second is whether the particle size uh, magnetization other type of energies uh, can also be taken into consideration or not yeah okay uh, let me uh, can you hear me yes hello? sir yes sir hello can, can you hear, hear me you. i yes. can hear you hello yes sir can you hear me yes yes i suppose you are not able to hear us hello his uh, so your video is hanged uh can you hear me now yeah yeah yes yes sorry i think again i lost the connection so uh let me tell you when you talk about gmr it is not a gmr material huh? you, you have seen that you know for example the work by albert fur peter grunberg etc they took uh, you know iron chromium iron kind of a multi layer stack right and um, i think the entire periodic table has been uh, most of the elements of the periodic table has been investigated by different people to find out so similarly they you know uh, iron cobalt alloy with mm -hmm. the copper and then the cobalt or permalloy copper cobalt gold so different combinations together you get this gmr stack or the spin valve stack right so people are not interested in this intrinsic entry ferromagnetically coupled system because that requires large magnetic field to make it parallel so that's why the spin valves became much more attractive with a small magnetic field you can switch the magnetization now things have gone even further up because now people don't even use magnetic field to switch the magnetization you pass current through it and switch the magnetization right so that is the gmr it's a assembly of or the spin valves is an assembly of different kinds of layers when you talk about cmr cmr is a colossal magnetoresistive material where you know for example lanthanum 0.67 strontium 0.33 mno gives yes. cmr but imagine that cmr gives you Uh, you know, hundred thousand percent uh, change in the magneto resistance at very low temperatures with uh, several tesla of magnetic field. You know that may not be useful here. So the device which I'm talking to you is about room temperature operating devices. That's why without computer, you know, without computer being dipped into liquid helium, we are able to uh, use our uh, computers, right? So the composition is not important, but at the same time, nowadays there is a lot of work. Okay. if we can improve the spin polarization of the ferromagnetic layer then mm -hmm. the effect can be improved okay. so there is lot of alloys are being tried with the different you know hoiseler alloys half hoiseler alloys different kinds of materials are being tried now to improve the spin polarization so theoretically there are materials with 100% spin polarization but in experiment there are very 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 rare cases you see Uh, uh full spin polarization so lot of material research is going on to make <coughs> full spin polarization yeah yes yeah, so i made me more questions uh, are there i'll just uh, read uh, from anamika bansal uh, will the state of magnetization of magnets not produce perturbation mm, i didn't know. okay probably what she wants to say okay maybe I, i i missed one point to tell maybe this is the time that i can mm -hmm. explain that see when you keep this magnet like this like a zero state mm -hmm. the question is that will it lie there like this forever in the zero state the answer is no the answer is no in the sense that i was talking about an energy barrier to switch mm -hmm. the magnetization from one direction to the other direction so the common consensus now is that the energy barrier height is such a way that this magnet remains in this state for 10 years so uh, it's a statistical process right so now the anisotropic constant and the volume of the material is optimized such a way that the information which is stored will stay for maybe 10 years or something like that right so now uh, so that is the lifetime of this bit in that direction right so okay. now the perturbation which she is talking about i'm not understanding probably she is talking i mean it's not huge magnetic field you are generating you know <clears throat> the good thing about magnetic field is that you know it dies off at a much 
faster rate as you uh, increase the distance. Even I have a 14 Tesla magnet in my lab and two meters away from that, I get negligible uh, you know, magnetic field. Yes. So in that way, there is no disturbance. And also people may ask the question, can this bit be influenced by external magnets? Mm -hmm. So the answer is, if you, if you take this, uh, tear it apart and put it inside a magnetic field, yes. Otherwise, if you use a computer here, and I'm using computer in my lab with the 14 Tesla magnet uh, just sitting uh, you know, in his, uh, nearby, and nothing happens. Yes, sir. Mr. Hello. Mr. Kumar. Yes. Uh, you missed some questions earlier. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just going because, yeah, uh, uh, because there are a just... large number of questions. Yeah. I just uh -huh. uh, go through it uh, slowly. Quickly. Uh, Very uh, quickly yes. because there are about 20, 22 questions, right? Uh -huh. Rekha, if you uh, find some new question, you can also put it up. Uh, no, here, there on the chat box itself, there are some new yeah. questions. So Pramukh Kumar is asking, uh, what about Moore's law like uh, disadvantage in spintronics? See, uh, see, for example, the, we have not reached uh, that kind of a level as far as spintronics is concerned. Still, there's a lot of miniaturization scope is there. Even the Moore's law itself, if you ask the experts, mm -hmm. the, the Moore's law is also getting shifted. You know, people... Uh, somebody, uh, I was attending a lecture by an expert in this area. He said that when he did his PhD in 1970s, people thought that Moore's law is coming to an end there. But even today, we are talking about Moore's law. So, you know, it is not. I mean, Spintronics has much more way to go. We have not reached the limits. And Mr. Nishant is asking how 45 nanometer sized magnets are made. Okay, let me tell you, it's not that the 45 nanometer magnets are made and placed it like this. You have a, a disc on which you deposit a film and the local regions of the disc, you are magnetizing it as a bit. So the pole, pole opening, you know, will decide what is the size of the, uh, and the pole width is also designing what is the size of this, uh, you know, bits kind of thing. It's not that you make the bits and assemble them together. It's a continuous film with the read head, the right head, you come and create regions of bits. So this is uh, from Prahlad. Uh, are transition metal magnetochemistry used on this field? Transition metal complexes with lasers. How is this done? Can you repeat the question once again? Yeah. Are transition metal magnetochemistry used on this field? Transition metal complexes with lasers, how is this done? Yeah. Uh, see, the second part, I, I don't know what, uh, what to answer. So the first part, let me ask a question. The transition, see, unfortunately for us, it's only iron, cobalt, nickel, which are the three ferromagnets in the system uh, with some, you know, GD, like a like a ferromagnet from the periodic table, but there are many alloys that are being made. So those alloys, as I said for the answer to the previous question, are becoming potential candidates for spintronic material as such. Sir, from Rajendra More, uh, as far as the accuracy of computers, what a high still of uh, manufacture of such magnetic materials is possible? Uh, can you repeat once again with the... Yes, sir. As far as the accuracy of computers, what a high still of manufacture of such magnetic materials is possible? High steel. High, high steel. steel or high steel. It, he may be asking high steel or high later steel. He has clarified he, later he has clarified. He wants to say skill, not steel. Yeah, see, uh, <clears throat> see, the, one should understand that this is not, I mean, if you look at the computers which you are using today, it is not by the work of one person, you know, millions of people at, you know, different industries came together and then made this thing. So, you know, skill set is also important, but at the same time, you know, uh, this, uh, that's why, you know, the students with, uh, you know, PhD degree, with the engineering degree and all get into this field. See, for example, one of my student, earlier PhD student is now working with the Seagate, right? So, uh, so 
so many people it's not that one person is making a computer kind of thing yeah so different kinds of skill sets are needed here you know fabrication scale uh, fundamental research first you know there is one set of fundamental research that is going on into the universities etc so there they will screen a lot of materials and then shortlist some you know small areas and then you know other people will take it up and then see how it can be scaled up is it scalable and those kind of things so uh, material development fabrication skills uh, electronics assembly skills everything comes into play here it's not one person or two i mean it's like thousands of people around the world is coming together to get these things that's how a computer is in front of you uh, again one question from uh, pramod kumar are no transistors used in mram which one are uh, no transistors no 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 you see the thing is that if you want to select a bit so there is a transistor in my mram circuit also there was a transistor and the transistor on or off state will decide whether the current passes through that element or not so transistors need to be so that's why this this material also need to be cmos compatible hmm so are the challenges yes yeah, so next question uh, raja pandi nadar what was the method used for making giant magneto resistors okay it started with uh, the first demonstration was with the molecular beam epitaxy where you know extremely good quality layers are made then later on uh, work by professor stuart parkin and others showed that sputter deposition is also possible so it also gives you very good good uh, very good giant magneto resistive materials now mbe sputter deposition even we have uh, seen with the laser ablation also we can make make metallic multi layers and gives very good gmr properties so these are the methods by which these are made so one more question uh, you can see here uh, from devidas golwade uh, which direction of magnetization we referring to in plane or perpendicular of the thin film uh, the the current hardest thing employs perpendicular magnetization so you make materials with the which are perpendicularly magnetized and that is being used okay so i think i have uh, ek minute to madhavi thakur desai actually her question remains unanswered she is asking what are the gmr 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 materials she yeah, asked twice actually <laughs> okay uh, as i uh, said gmr material if you start, uh, look at the history the first one that came out was iron chromium multi layer then permalloy copper cobalt layer then cobalt iron chromium i mean uh, copper cobalt layer so there are different materials i mean if you look at the work of process toward parkin i think uh, the entire periodic i mean many elements in the periodic table has been explored <laughs> so from uh, tushar pandit once again what are other applications are uh, based on spintronics yeah as i as i told you this you know magnetic field sensor is the major major thing because you need magnetic field sensors as time progresses you will realize that many things needs a magnetic field sensor right so that is a, one of the major application of this and then this uh, read head in the computer artist again that's a sensor and then this magnetic random access memory yeah? that's also something and other memory concepts are also being coming up with uh, magnets uh, with uh, spintronics and nowadays people talk about even neuromorphic computing and other things also with this so there's a lot of scope i mean uh, those who would like to do research in future i would say that this is one of the areas where a lot of potential lying ahead and from uh, krishna kumari vedar it is uh, uh, her question how much is it useful in mobile yeah see for example i think in mobile i don't think we are using right now but you know for example if you wanted to see the direction in your mobile you need a magnetic field sensor inside right so so gps and other purposes you know if you want to see the directions you need this magnetic field sensor inside and also memory imagine that you know you can have a 1 tb memory in your mobile phone uh, that is uh, equivalent to a ram speed you know you can just see any movie i mean without any problems i think <laughs> somebody was telling me that you know 90 95% of the research that people do in this area is for entertainment ultimately <laughs> so 
Sir, and Advait is asking, at what level uncertainty plays role in tunnel effect GMR system? Processor can be uh, sun using this technology. See, the thing is that I just told about one element, right? But there are a lot of other things that is getting embedded into the system about error correction, see if something goes wrong, how to you know, correct these things and also there's a lot of work in that area as well. It's not it's in the laboratory. If I make 10 devices, if five works, it's okay for me. You know, I'll do my studies, right? Whereas when it comes to industry, you know, when the millions of uh, these devices are there, everything should work. And if something fails in between, you cannot say that, you know, information is lost. There are correction mechanisms and a lot of other things are also embedded. We were just only telling about the introduction and then, you know, the physics behind it. So Rajendra More is asking, uh, are ferro and ferrimagnetic materials uh, similar? Uh, no. Imagine that I have uh, three magnetic moments like this, right? So when all these things are parallel, I call it as a ferromagnet, right? And imagine that the center one is going down, so it is adjacent one, sir, anti-parallel. Uh, anti this is uh, anti-ferromagnetic. Now imagine that the one which is in the opposite direction is lower in strength, like this. So that means they are anti-parallel, but the ones which are pointing up as a net magnetic moment. So it is not, here it is getting, if I have four such pencils, if they are anti-parallel like this, then everything is getting cancelled out. Imagine that out of this, the, the, two, the, the two pencils which is pointing downwards as lower magnetic moment. So that means the sublattice moment is low. Then there is a net magnetic moment upward, but the total moment, I mean, uh, but they're anti-parallelly uh, aligned. Now, if you really want to distinguish between a ferromagnet and a ferrimagnet, a hysteresis loop will give both ferromagnet and ferrimagnet hysteresis loop. But if you look at the one upon susceptibility versus temperature at very high temperatures, the, for example, ferromagnet in the entire temperature range will give you one upon susceptibility versus temperature a positive intercept. Whereas for a ferrimagnet, uh, close to TC, it will give a positive intercept, but at extremely high temperatures, if you go and extrapolate, it will give you a negative uh, ex uh, you know, cut on the x-axis. This is how you distinguish between ferrimagnet and a ferromagnet. Sir, Professor KG Bole has asked, Applications of electronic devices was comparatively faster, but developments in applications of spintronics is slow. Is uh, it? I would say just uh, different because if you look at the read head, I mean, this is one of the fastest uh, technology that has come to our consumer market after the discovery. 1988 discovery, 1998 in our computer hard disk. Uh, it is one of the fastest. Uh, comparable to the transistor. So, and in 2005, we have TMR in our hard disks, right? So everybody, I mean, if you look at the use, everybody is using this. So it is, uh, it's fairly fast compared to many other technologies. Uh, one more question from YouTube has asked, Anjali Prajapati. Uh, sir, in GMR, only three layers are necessary? Okay, uh, I was explaining things with the three layer, but if you look at that uh, stack which uh, Albert Ford made, iron, chromium, iron, chromium, 50 stacks. That means 50 layers of iron, 50 layers of chromium, like a multi-layer stack. I think one more question I have uh, left. It is from Devidas Gulwade. Uh, how is read-write speed of GMR sensor? Okay. <clears throat> Let me tell you, the reading is quite fast, but uh, no, GMR sensor cannot write. GMR sensor is only to read. The reading is quite fast, but the time taken to bring each bit below the read head is the one that is taking time. Reading is a fast process, but each bit is brought in, I mean, it's, it's in milliseconds, you know. So that is why your uh, hard drive, when you try to read, it takes time. Yes. I think I have uh, covered all the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very, very nice talk. Over to you, Rekha.
yeah yeah thank you thank you nita madam uh, uh, may i invite now dr kg bole to uh, present a word of thanks summarize the lecture yeah bole sir please unmute yourself bole sir and thank you rekha madam yes uh it was a excellent talk covering all the details of Uh, the spintronics in a very very lucid manner with the best possible demonstrations and i am sure 100% of the audience means the listeners uh, how are very much clear about the concepts of spin spintronics sir it was a very very nice occasion to be uh, to hear you today on behalf of rj college as well as the iapt i thank you thank you very much i also thank the authorities of the rj college the staff members of the rj college as well as the attendees the participants of for today's lecture series and for posing their wonderful questions although the questions were answered in a very very best possible manner by the speaker and hence i request all the audience to keep on posting the questions so that you can learn more about the new technologies coming in future thank you all thank you all again yeah thank uh, you thank you everyone i have the feedback uh, poll here i am getting 100% excellent uh, feedback here uh, so thank you very much anil kumar uh, Uh, to have a wonderful session here uh, at the same time here i would like to thank uh, my principal also who has given us a very free hand and uh, one more thing which i would like to you know convey you today uh, today was our uh, inauguration of independent uh, youtube channel and uh, zoom account for department of physics uh, which is attached to earlier we were using college account now from today onwards we are using our own streaming and uh, thanks for uh, this particular venture by dr kiran polvankar and the other team members so we yesterday have worked throughout the day having marathon meetings and testing etc and i suppose it has worked out so uh, without any technical uh, glitches i think we could complete uh, this uh, today series of uh, today's lecture so thank you once again dr anil kumar uh, on behalf of all of us thank i would like to invite the participants uh, for the next lecture of the series on thursday 25th this lecture will be delivered by dr uh, tarun saurdeep from iser on uh, introduction to gravitational waves and applications uh, i request uh, all of you who are with us right from the first lecture of the series uh, to be with us again for this wonderful session which are going to we are looking forward from uh, dr Sir tarun saurdeep on gravitational waves thank you once uh, again to all participants and the uh, resource person dr amit thank you i request uh, host dr kiran to end the meeting thank you anil